everyone and good afternoon if you are connected from a different place and welcome to this webinar held in the framework of, of Slow Foods Terra Madre. This webinar is entitled The Opportunities of the United Nations Decade of Family Farming for Strengthening Resilience and the Sustainability of Family Farmers. I'm very happy to, to welcome you to this event. We have a set a list of very interesting speakers for you today, uh, so I will not speak too much. The first thing I would like to do is to present all the speakers which will be joining us today, which have joined us today. And I would like to start with uh, Laura Lorenzo, which is the, the World Rural Forum Director and a good friend of Slow Foods, uh, which will be followed by Hakim Baliner, which is the SF president and farmer from Uganda, Nikolce Nikolovsky, who is the president of the Slow Food Macedonia Board and Farmer, Ward Ansel, who is a senior technical specialist from the International Land Coalition, Valera Barchiesi, the, uh, the UN Mountain Partnership and the Coalition for Fragile Ecosystems, Guillermo Brady from the Head of Family Farming Engagement and Parliamentarian Alliances um, of FAO, and Daniel Campos, which is from the Technical Secretariat of the National Committee of Family Farming from Paraguay. I have to say, I'm very happy to have you today. This webinar uh, is born by through a, an initiative that Slow Food is carrying out with the World Rural Forum in order to raise awareness, discuss both the opportunities and challenges of this decade of family farming for smallholder farmers around the globe. Um, this collaboration has taken two different parts, one which is this webinar you have all been invited to attend, and the, and the other which was the development of three small videos which were aimed at highlighting some of the aspects of the decade of family farming, some of the opportunities and main challenges, and the network possibilities. So without wasting too much time, I would like to first present the first short video that has been developed in association world with the World Rural Forum. The, last, the second and third videos will be finalized in the coming months and will be shared with all the audience. But before we pass to the speakers, I would like to show you this, this first video. Thank you. Food exists because of the work of 2.5 billion family farmers. Indeed, family farming produces 80% of the world's food. Nowadays, 1.9 million people are overweight and 690 million suffer from hunger. This situation could be increased by the COVID-19 pandemic by more than 130 million. Also, currently, 2.3 billion people are deprived of water. Access to land and water are two major challenges of family farming. Family farmers manage 70 to 80 percent of the land but their access to land is being threatened in its quality and availability, damaging our food systems and adversely affecting smallholders and family farms, indigenous peoples, rural women, youth and landless rural communities. The inequality in access to land threatens 2.5 billion people, especially women who only own 15% of agricultural land. In addition, 1% of farms, the largest farms, manage 70% of the land on the planet. O acesso à terra, à água, os recursos naturais é primordial para fortalecer a agricultura familiar em todo o mundo. Nós vivemos um processo mundial de concentração de terra de dificuldade aos recursos naturais, fazendo com que a agricultura familiar, os territórios fiquem sempre menores e inclusive enfrentando um processo muito perigoso de estrangeirização das terras. Para fortalecer a agricultura familiar como um meio de um, produzir uma alimentação saudável, 
como fazer frente aos processos de soberania e segurança alimentar, é fundamental debatermos o acesso aos recursos naturais, especialmente a questão da terra, do território e da água. The access to land by family farming should be enhanced by the promotion of public policies. Now, more than ever, let us value, support and trust in the enormous potential of family farming to ensure sustainability of food and the sustainability of the planet. I hope you enjoyed that and as I was saying another a further two videos will be developed in the, in the coming weeks. Before I pass uh, the baton to the first speaker I would like to remind the audience that this webinar is transmitted both in English and Spanish and by clicking on the little globe at the bottom of your screen you can choose the language. So without uh, further delay I would like to pass uh, the word to, to Laura Lorenzo who is the director of the World Rural Forum and has been a good friend to Slow Food for some years. Please, Laura. Gracias. Gracias, Federico. Eh, bueno, quiero comenzar agradeciendo a Slow Food con el que compartimos la organización de, de este evento y con el que trabajamos para, para visibilizar ¿no? los retos de la agricultura familiar. Especialmente en el vídeo se mostraba el acceso a la tierra, que es uno de los grandes retos. ¿no? También trabajamos con Slow Food para para incorporar ¿no? la perspectiva de, de los consumidores a, a nuestro trabajo ¿no? como productores de, de alimentos. También quiero agradecer a la Coalición Internacional de la Tierra, que a través de diferentes iniciativas viene apoyando a las organizaciones de agricultura familiar para hacer efectivo, eh, impulsar el decenio de la agricultura familiar y que, y que está participando también en, en los vídeos ¿no? que, que hemos que estamos produciendo junto, junto a Slow Food. Eh, bueno, yo quería compartir con, con las personas que estamos hoy presentes, tanto, tanto a través del enlace Zoom como los que están siguiéndonos, eh, creo que por YouTube. Eh, quiero, quiero aprovechar el espacio que nos facilita Terra Madre, la oportunidad del decenio de las Naciones Unidas. Eh, Quiero, quiero aprovechar, quiero decir, el espacio que, me, que nos ha facilitado Terra Madre para hablar sobre la oportunidad que ofrece el decenio de la agricultura familiar. ¿Para qué? Pues para crear condiciones que mejoren la calidad de vida de los y las agricultores familiares que, como dice el vídeo que acabamos de escuchar, producen el 80% de los alimentos mientras concentran mucha parte de, de la pobreza rural, ¿no? El decenio de las Naciones Unidas es un instrumento concreto eh, que nos permite definir medidas y trabajos a medio, corto y largo plazo que mejoren la resiliencia, la sostenibilidad y la viabilidad de, de nuestra agricultura familiar. ¿no? Eh, nuestros colegas de FAO, a quien también agradecemos eh, la presencia hoy, explicarán más adelante cómo, cómo se implementa y cómo se trabaja en el decenio de la agricultura familiar, pero yo quiero destacar algunas características innovadoras, ¿no? diría yo, del decenio, que creo que pueden ayudar a, a comprender la dimensión, ¿no? a por qué insistimos en que es una gran oportunidad eh, el decenio de la agricultura familiar y creo que servirán para introducir un poco la discusión. ¿no? En primer lugar, una característica que, que a nosotros como Foro Rural Mundial nos parece muy importante es que es sobre el proceso, ¿no? ¿Cómo se ha llegado al decenio? Es el primer decenio, y quiero resaltarlo y siempre lo decimos, solicitado y promovido por la sociedad civil, por las organizaciones de la agricultura familiar, que apoyados por organismos internacionales y por algunos gobiernos, llevaron la necesidad de fortalecer la agricultura familiar a lo más alto de la agenda internacional. ¿Qué es lo más alto? Pues la Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas, ¿no? que, que fue la que publicó una resolución a favor de, del decenio. Y esta resolución, te, también quiero destacar, que fue apoyada 
inmensamente por más de 100 países, lo que da muestra de, de lo importante que es la agricultura familiar para, para todos estos países. ¿no? La segunda característica es sobre el alcance. El, el decenio sitúa a los agricultores y las agricultoras familiares como protagonistas no solo de su desarrollo, sino también como líderes del cumplimiento de todos los ODS prácticamente. ¿no? La tercera característica para nosotros es, eh, se refiere a los mecanismos de implementación, porque este decenio eh, promueve la actuación conjunta, el diálogo, la construcción entre diferentes actores, eh, incluidos, por ejemplo, las oficinas de, de FAO y FIDA, que quiero citar, los gobiernos, las organizaciones eh, agrarias, eh, y con ello nos referimos a pescadores, eh, pastores, indígenas, etc. Eh, y llama también al decenio a crear espacios permanentes para el diálogo político, como luego explicará nuestro compañero de, de Paraguay, ¿no? cómo están trabajando en Paraguay. Como cuarta característica diría yo que es una resolución internacional, pero que se ha de implementar también en los países, no queda solo en, en Naciones Unidas, ¿no? tiene que ser implementada por los gobiernos que tienen que mejorar sus marcos normativos, jurídicos, etcétera, para apoyar a su agricultura familiar. O sea, lo que hace el decenio es, es hacer un marco y estimular a los países para que desarrollen políticas e inversiones en la agricultura familiar. En este sentido, el decenio tiene como meta, por ejemplo, que 100 países eh, tengan su propio plan de agricultura familiar. Es decir, 100 países en los que gobierno, organismo, organizaciones agrarias, organismos internacionales, centros de investigación y otros actores acuerden en un plan cómo fortalecer su agricultura familiar, qué consideran que son las actividades o programas prioritarios en cuanto a mejorar el acceso a la tierra, por ejemplo, a la incorporación de jóvenes a la agricultura, que es muy importante en Europa y en otras partes del mundo, al empoderamiento de la mujer, a la mejora de la rentabilidad de las, de las granjas ¿no? o al apoyo a la mitigación al cambio climático, entre otros muchos grandes retos que estoy segura que, que los compañeros luego van a, van a relatar. Sexta característica es que tiene una mirada holística. ¿Esto qué, qué quiere decir con eso? Que los agricultores no solo son productores de alimentos, sino que son responsables del mantenimiento de la biodiversidad, del cuidado del medio ambiente, de la economía rural, de conseguir medios rurales vivos. ¿no? Eh, y como séptima y última característica innovadora, y para mí eh, quizás sea una de las más importantes, es la movilización fortísima de actores. ¿no? Ya hay 1.600 organizaciones involucradas trabajando eh, para conseguir compromisos en favor de la agricultura familiar a través del decenio, eh, diseñando diferentes instrumentos, como, como veremos más adelante ¿no? en, en la charla de hoy. El decenio marca, por tanto, una oportunidad histórica, pero a la vez una enorme responsabilidad. ¿no? No podemos volver la mirada en 2028 y ver que la situación de pobreza, migración, falta de oportunidades y rentabilidad de las granjas familiares sigue persistiendo ¿no? en las áreas rurales. El decenio requiere una fuerte movilización de personas, de organizaciones, de recursos y de compromisos. Y hago hoy, y siempre lo hacemos, ¿no? un, un llamamiento a, a la responsabilidad, de, que, que iniciando por nosotros, ¿no? como Foro Rural Mundial, a los gobiernos, a los organismos internacionales, al resto de organizaciones agrarias, para que eh, trabajemos juntos y el decenio realmente sea transformador. Hoy tendremos la oportunidad de dialogar sobre los retos de la agricultura a través de varias experiencias y entender mejor cómo utilizar la herramienta del decenio de la agricultura familiar. Así que deseo un buen diálogo. Y he dejado, eh, Federico, mis últimas palabras para referirme al impacto de la crisis de la COVID, pero en una de sus múltiples dimensiones que me parece muy relevante para lo que hoy vamos a discutir. ¿no? La pandemia del COVID hizo que los ciudadanos fueran conscientes de nuevo en muchos territorios eh, del valor de los y las agricultoras familiares que producen alimentos locales y saludables y que los gobiernos eh, en algunos casos tenían un poco olvidado el sector, se dieron cuenta mm, del valor de ser cada vez más autosuficientes, de, de impulsar la producción ag agraria local. ¿no? Y quiero destacar que debemos aprovechar y canalizar ese reconocimiento a la agricultura familiar y la atención que se presta hoy en día a los sistemas alimentarios 
para generar las condiciones que aseguren un futuro sostenible y resiliente para nuestras y nuestras agriculturas familiares a través del decenio de las Naciones Unidas para la Agricultura Familiar. Gracias. Con esto te paso, Federico, de nuevo la palabra. Thank you very much, Laura. Very interesting. And I think you touched upon two very important points. Uh, the first one, um, which is a characteristic of this decade, how many different stakeholders, how many different stakeholders were involved in this from the country level to the civil society to the different organizations of the UN? And this is not something which is always achieved and it has been very successful in the decade. And the second point you touched upon, which I found very interesting was the final beneficiaries who are the stars of this initiative, which are the far farmers themselves. And the farmers, not only in their production of food and food security, but in their role of guardians of the rural landscapes, of the territories, of the ecosystems, which they curate and guard. So I think uh, these two very important points from Laura, thank you. Linking up to this, uh, to this uh, role of guardianship of the farmers, I would like to pass the word to our second speaker, Hakim Baliner, which is the ESAF president, but also a farmer himself, who is joining us from Uganda. Uh, so please, Hakim, you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Allow me to uh, stream my video. Okay, uh, thank you very much. As already said, I'm Hakim Valiraine, that I was a chairperson of Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum. And I'm from Uganda, because Uganda is also a, a country, a member of the, the, the Small Scale Farmers. Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum is a network of grassroots small scale farm organization working in Sini countries of Eastern and Southern Africa in the ESA region. The movement is a small scale farmer initiated, farmer led and farmer owned. Uh, to run very fast, these countries are Kenya, Uganda, Malawi, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, South Africa, Z Zimbabwe, Zambia, Eswatini, Lesotho, Seychelles, and Madagascar. Its surpass is to enable small scale farmers in Eastern and Southern Africa to speak as a united voice so that issues, concerns, and recommendations become an integral part of the policies and practices at national, regional, and international level. ESAF started in 2002 prior to the World Summit of Sustainable Development and was registered in the Republic of Uganda. Uh, we have uh, an independent regional board made up of farmers from, from all the Sini countries. Uh, back around to the sustainable food system that favor family farmers. Our planet is at its limit thanks in part to the today's fossil fuel hunger corporate food system. And the poor and marginalized of the global south are being bearing the brunt. There should, should not be a trade-off between the right to healthy food and healthy planet. Despite the, the normalization of fear of fear mongering talk of food shortage by 2050, we are producing more than today than we need. Decades of sustainable intensification have deforestated wild areas collapsed fish stocks and eroded environmental boundaries. And I know, I believe everybody uh, knows all about this. Additionally, the support for agroecological, traditional, at seen and smallholder farm, family farmers production is being shifted towards fossil fuel hungry agriculture, food waste prone, corporate farming and transnational distribution. We already heard from the first speaker uh, when she alluded to, to such. We therefore say that sustainable food systems harmonize human need and aspiration towards the planetary and our environment. Our struggle as family farmers amid the United Nations decade of family farming, our major challenges. We already, we already know that globally hunger is steadily on rise. The Food and Agriculture Organization and food for, of Food Security and Nutrition in the world of the 2020 report estimated that 690 million people in the world are hungry. And 90% of the world hungry people can be found in two, eight, two regions. Five out of 10 live in Asia, while, of, while four out of 10 are in Africa. 
Africa is projected to overtake Asia in 10 years with the 420 million people undernourished. And uh, as I speak now, 3% out of, of, of 3, 3 to 10% of the population is under that category. And 20 to 50% of the children uh, of the children are, are stunting. Most, most food secure people in Africa in rural areas where food is produced, can you imagine that? Since, since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic last year, the can exposed how the present narrative of feeding the world are false. And this calls for a radical need to change on our food system. You know, all the corporation is closed down. All of those corporations which are producing food are uh, shut down, but family farmers could not produce. We continue producing even during the pandemic and feed the world. Therefore, we say that an unjust, unequitable, unhealthy, and unsustainable food system brought about by global monopolies in agriculture production and trade by decades of global grabs, of, of global land grabbing and environmental devastation intended for profit has manifested. Our poor policies, implementation, lack of prioritization, lack of land ownership. For, for youth, women, and other disasters like climate change, like climate change, low-cost war, poor post service hand technologies, uh, all are happening when the African framework for transformation of agriculture, the Malawi Declaration is only four years away in 2025, and the sustainable government goals are nine years away, are nine years away in 2030. So we are wondering whether this will be achieved. Uh, what are our major, our major opportunities? The United Nations is decade of family farming um, and, and, and major partners for food and agriculture organization and, and IFAD offers a framework, a framework for farmers to engage at global, continental, regional, and the national, national and community level. We want, it, we want it domesticated at regional, national level and, at, and all of the seven pillars implemented. The presence, of the regional national framework on agriculture and rural development. That, that is to say, the sign of the goal of number one, two, as well as the goal of three, seven, thirteen, and fourteen and fifteen. And the African CADIP Malabo seven goals offer the framework for engagement. We in Africa, the African Union developed the, 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 the comprehensive Agri Africa agriculture development program with the seven goals. Uh, due to time constraint, I'll just run very fast from those one. Our colleagues maybe who may not be aware of which are these goals. One of them is the commitment to the principles and values of the CAD processes. And this one was supposed to be completed by all countries at national level to develop the CAD framework. And, but as I speak now, due, after the last year by annual review report, only two countries had, were on track. And the second one is enhancing investment finance in agriculture and allocate, uh, that is allocating 10% of the public expenditure to the agriculture. Uh, for this one, I need to make it, I'm so sorry to mention that no country was on track according to the last year's biennial review report of 2019. Then the third one is ending hunger by 2025. And this one meant that accelerating our cultural growth, reduce post service losses, increase our cultural productivity and improve on the nutritional status in Africa. Only one country was on track and that was Uganda. Having poverty through our culture was the fourth by 2050. And this was through inclusive agricultural growth and transformation on nine, 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 nine countries. Now, boosting your trade, uh, trade in Africa, agricultural commodities and services. Uh, this one, only 29 countries on track. Then enhancing resilience to climate variability. This was, was to improve resilience capacity of household, house, household to, achieve, uh, to achieve climate and weather related, related risks and create permanent investment, investment in the resilience building. Only 11 countries on the continent of Africa were on track. Enhancing mutual accountability for, for actions and, uh, and results. This one, only 14 countries were on track. Now, when we look at that, we are, as a regional organization, we've been engaging country, our government to make sure that they, are, uh, they, are, they, they fulfill the mandates they, they accorded to and, and ratified. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, appreciation of agroecology for, 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 for soil, fertility, pest control, risk reduction, food and dietary diversity helps poor farmers cope with climate change and avoid the six and debit trap.
The fourth one, the United Nations Food System Summit uh, would be the best platform for family farmers to demonstrate our importance, ability, and role we have played over time and again to feed the world had it been hijacked by opportunist corporations. You know very well that in that summit there, we are not so sure whether whoever was selected would be representing the issues of the family farmers. So we believe that maybe this, this, would, this should have been our opportunities. Our call for action is at all levels. First of, first one is putting family farmers at the heart of all public policies and budget policies, planning, implementation, monitoring, especially women, youth, and poor men. Two, full implementation of the funding at all levels of the, the United Nations, of the UNDF, UNDF the sign of the goal one, two, three, seven, 13, 14, and, and 15, and the African Union Complex Agriculture Development Plan, the seven goals I already presented. Uh, another one is revised and re energized rural and peri urban development agenda as a center for sustainable production and processing by supporting one, conventional producers and processing, uh, processing family farmers cooperative, clean energy, clean energy infrastructure, that is road, irrigation, health, storage, market, then capital. Then for fifth is information communication. We cannot avoid ICT as farmers because now trading has become, uh, uh, has become online. For, and this, this is just for just equitable, healthy, and sustainable food system. Four is we also demand that the United Nations create space for family farmers during the upcoming UN Food System Summit in October this year, 2021, if justice is to prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, allow me in there and I thank the organizers, Slow Food, World Food, World, uh, uh, World World Forum, and other partners for giving us Eastern and Southern Africa small scale farmers one this opportunity to present. I submit. Thank you. Thank you, Hakim. Very interesting. And I'm sorry we, we have to rush through, through things. We don't have enough time for it. But thank you very much. And as you know, Slow Food has a personal link with Uganda. Our vice president is from Uganda. So it is a country we have a lot of love for. And now um, I will pass to the, um, the next speaker, who is another farmer, but also the president of Slow Food Macedonia of the board, uh, Nikol Nikolovsky. Please, the floor is yours. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Federico, for the invitation. You hear me, I hope. Uh, today I will speak uh, about the new opportunity for sm small scale producers and farmers in uh, Macedonia. Mm, I, shortly uh, for introduction, I will present a few agriculture facts about the um, agriculture in our country is the small country from the southeastern part of the Europe. Uh, it uh, was part of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, it's area around uh, 25,000 uh, square kilometer population, around the 2 million agriculture area is around 1,121,000 hectares and arable uh, area uh, 509,000 uh, hectares. Rural population in our country is around 45%, and agriculture households is around uh, one, uh, 100, 180,000 uh, families, uh, which uh, are connected uh, with the agriculture. Uh, this uh, number is uh, big for small country, but uh, is decreasingly very rapidly. In the last two, uh, 10 years, we lost 10,000 uh, farmers, uh, like this uh, ho household. Uh, uh, family households in our country uh, uh, use uh, over 80% uh, of the agricultural land, and every family has around uh, 1.4 uh, 1, uh, hectares of the land. Agriculture products participate with 20% or in our national GDP. Uh, I'm coming from Slow Food Macedonia. It's a national organization of the Slow Food in our country. And uh, in this and this slide, I'm presenting our network, uh, which uh, 
is uh, very active between the few uh, uh, organizations most active in the area of agriculture and food production. How are we acting uh, regarding this uh, uh, situation in our agriculture? Uh, in this uh, uh, slide, I present the local food system, where is the small scale producers and farmers. And we, through the, our local grassroots network uh, of the Convivia, we, supporting, we, are, we are supporting the small uh, producers in their production and distribution of their products to the final consumers. Um, in, in the same time, in national, uh, association where I'm coming from, uh, we collect a lot of information uh, for some problems, some uh, gaps, some uh, uh, possibility, ideas, how to uh, support and how uh, we to help uh, small scale uh, farmers. We are developing together with the local network uh, and together with the producers, uh, different campaigns, projects to, to support, to increase the capacity of the farmers and the producers on the grassroots level. But in the same time, we are acting in the front of, uh, of institution. We take advocacy and lobbying to uh, make some changes in our laws and uh, regulatives and program for support of the small scale producers to uh, provide uh, positive uh, environment for development to growing of these small scale producers. Uh, many years uh, ago, um, our food system is based on the big uh, food industries uh, from the socialism uh, uh, is uh, this uh, trend uh, provided. And um, many uh, small scale producers is uh, 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 looked by ministry, by the science, like weak part of the our food system. But uh, now uh, we as a slow food and also after the uh, crisis of the uh, COVID, uh, we see the um, big potential of these small scale producers to develop a uh, local food system to provide more food security and a sustainable local economy. And for that uh, purpose, we, act, we are working together with Agency of Food uh, and we work it to, to provide the flexible, uh, new flexible regulatives for the food safety requirements in the line with the AU directives. And uh, last years, we provided two regulatives um, for small scale producers to follow these flexible regulatives to have access on the legal market uh, with their products. Uh, in the same time, with Ministry of Agriculture, we signed a memorandum for cooperation in February uh, 2019. And in November, we signed a social partnership. And we worked to change uh, wine law uh, Macedonia is uh, one of the famous country of the ex wine exporter, but the problem uh, in our wine sector is that uh, uh, sector is driven by big uh, wine industry and small uh, grape growers is providing raw material for big industry. And uh, uh, usually they uh, take uh, the grapes for low prices and uh, that uh, for many years uh, makes not a sustainable system and not generate development in this sector. And in the same time, we have a big potential. And we uh, advocate to, for change of the wine law and now is allowed every family to have a possibility to make wine from oven wine, uh, from the grapes of, from uh, oven uh, vineyards to uh, 100,000 liters wine capacity. In the same time, in national rural uh, program for supporting of the agriculture uh, for this year will be provided small grants uh, for uh, small scale uh, producers to invest in their uh, facility 
to add value value on this uh, uh, in their products, not to, not to be only providers of the raw materials to big industry. Uh, our idea in the uh, with this uh, program uh, with together with the ministry is to to support to create added value of their products and high level of uh, finalization of their products. Uh, for this purpose, uh, we create producers database in our website. Uh, this tool we use to collect uh, information for more uh, producers to be in the in connection with us to share information to to uh, listen their problems to advocate uh, these uh, uh, problems to the ministry to other institutions to solve and to to make some achievement uh, our goal for this year is in this database to have one uh, thousand uh, producers in our database and uh, officially, then we'll, we will become economic partner of the Ministry of Agriculture. That means that in every working groups in the ministry, where is the bring the new laws, new programs, new regulatives, uh, will participate our member and to uh, our member can uh, affect the decisions that will be bring uh, in these working groups. Also, we work uh, in the grassroots level, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, to build capacity of the small scale producers. Uh, they have no capacity uh, to drive the urban family businesses, uh, but we, with support with us and other organization, uh, we supporting them for business planning, prices calculation, promotion, and to use narrative labels. Also, we support, uh, especially in the pandemic uh, period last uh, year and this year, promoting of uh, online sales platforms uh, where will be uh, uh, small scale producers will offer their products. Also, we prepare uh, two uh, guides uh, for, uh, with recommendation of some producers, one is the uh, with the restaurants, which uh, closely collaborate and um, uh, uh, takes the products from small scale produ producers, and a slow wine guide uh, where we present the small wineries, and uh, like added value also we promoting the agrotourism via slow food travel platform. I hope for one month. We will be active and will uh, we put all the, our producers in this platform that can be offered uh, uh, like touristic offer. In this process, we learn some lessons like organization and uh, we are evaluate our, uh, our work and uh, with uh, join forces with other organization, with the producers to go uh, in through the bigger success. Thank you. This is my presentation. Thank you, Nicolce. That was a very interesting window on the role of slow food at a country level and how it operates, but also on the key role of smallholder firemen in ensuring rural livelihoods, in reducing rural out migration, but also on the clear need to work with policymakers and with governments, both at the, both at a local and a national level. I would like now to pass the word to our next speaker, uh, Ward Anso, who is a senior technical specialist at the International Land Coalition. I will stop saying that all these organizations are good friends with Slow Food because they are all good friends with Slow Food. So please, Ward, the floor is yours. Thank you, Federico. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, I will share my screen. Here you go. First of all, um, I would like to thank the organizers to, to invite me to, to present the report that we launched uh, now a couple of months ago. It was entitled Land Inequality, uh, Uneven Ground. And as you can see from the title, this is, this is not really on, on opportunities and, and sustainability, but actually on the other side of the coin, it is highlighting a threat to family farmers. 
Of course, at the end of the meeting, of the end of the presentation, sorry, I, I will come back to, to, to solutions to this inequality and also to, to elements to, to strengthen the resilience of, of family farmers. My presentation will be very short and I will just highlight three core messages or three core items. The first one, I will come back to the report and give you an overview of what we think is a shocking state of uh, unequal land uh, patterns uh, on our planet. Second uh, message will be on the implications this inequality um, represents for land access and control for family farmers. And then I will come back to the urgent need to act on land inequality for more resilient, sustainable and equitable societies. So coming back to the, to the core results of this report, the first one is the shocking reality of land inequality on our planet. Since the 1980s, in every region of the world, land inequality and thus land concentration is increasing. Two continents or two broader regions, Latin America and Africa, had earlier on decreasing trends of land inequality. But since the 1980s, even these continents, these regions have reversed these trends and went up. Latin America, because it had already such an unequal land pattern from previous uh, decades and previous centuries, um, was rather stable. But again, as I said, is increasing now. Africa, due to increase of uh, um, uh, population pressure and the shrinking of of lands in a big chunk of, of the, the, the smaller areas of the, of the distribution of land um, was also decreasing. But again, here it is increasing very rapidly since the 2000s. So with the structural adjustment program since 1980s in all regions, land inequality and land concentration is now increasing. But worse than that, it is not only increasing, it is, and it has been underestimated still today. And in this report, in this research project, we've identified and developed new methodologies um, to better measure land inequality. And if we take into consideration these better methodologies that, that take in, into account, first of all, landlessness, multiple ownership, so companies or families that own multiple lands, but also um, the quality and the price of land, we can say that overall land inequality has been underestimated by about 41%. In Africa even, land inequality has been underestimated by 74%. So not only this is increasing, what we thought the level of inequality was, has been very much underestimating. And it's not a little bit, it's up to 74% in Africa where the differences are the highest. What does this effectively mean for land inequality? That globally, the top 10% of bigger owners and controllers over the land own about 70 and control about 70%. The bottom 50% of the populations that own land own and control only 3% of the land. Of course, these, the, these figures are very different per continent. As we see here, Latin America is still the highest um, <clears throat> with about 70% owned by the, the, the uh, sorry, almost 80% by the top 10. But um, in, in also Southeast Asia and Africa are catching up with Latin America with regards to uh, land inequality. The most stable are the, the previous communist countries, China and Vietnam, for example, where uh, it remains uh, at about 50%. The lower graph, you see there what the 50 smallest owners and controllers own. And there we see it is very low. In Latin America, it's even under 1%. But this is not all. And this is not all the worst of, of, of the whole message we want to give. The two figures I gave you, or the two trends I gave you previously, was focusing on ownership. Uh, on. If we take into consideration 
control of land directly or control over land indirectly through value chains or financial instruments, it's even worse. Unfortunately, we don't have figures for that because it's very opaque. It's what I call here hidden hands. We don't know how much the companies own. We don't know how much um, certain contractual arrangements allow them to control, et cetera, et cetera. But there are stories mushrooming and presented in the report that can show us extreme situations and extremely concentrated, and give us an idea of extremely concentrated global food systems and value chains. And although this is not directly on land or does not concern the ownership of land, it gives these entities the control over and the control of what happens on the land and what the return is of, on the, of the land for these entities, these companies and these, and these people. What we see mushrooming from these stories and from, from secondary sources that we have uh, used in this report is that due to this increasing inequality and the increase of, of concentration and control over land, uh, Lodred are working for the FAO, doing a, a report for the FAO mentions here that the largest 1% of farms in the world operate more than 70% of the world's farmland. Another example that came out in the report based on South Africa, for example, is that when we take into consideration all farmers in South Africa, that means the big commercial farms, but also the small and non-commercial farms, it is estimated that 0.28% of farms produce around 80% of the value of agricultural production. I'm not wrong here. This is not a, a typing mistake. You're reading well. Point Two eight percent. So one fifth of a percent is controlling and producing eighty percent of the value of agricultural products. That is how concentrated our um, food systems are in some parts of the world. Now, what implications does it have for land access and control of family farms? Of course, the extreme land inequality will lead to less and less land available for the large majority of the people. This is in most countries. Um, it's in all regions, maybe not in all countries, but in all regions, in most countries, where we see that there's a missing middle. We come from, on one side, huge landowners, and on the other side, huge masses with smaller and smaller land availability, available uh, per family or per, per farm. Madagascar, for example, we are far under a hectare uh, per family. Senegal as well is now under a hectare per family, et cetera. So it's a very concentrated sector versus a smallholder sector. And here I'm underscoring smallholder. I'm not speaking about family farming here because in the concentrated there are also family farms, but a smallholder where the, the holders of the land become smaller and smaller, whether they're family or others. Um, and that is considered many for its other functions. And these other functions become more and more only social. A social reproduction for a population that would not move to the cities or that would not become squatters or that, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, the concentrated one has an, becomes more and more, it becomes more and more visible that it's farming without farmers. These are not farmers anymore as we speak about family farmers. These are corporates. These are financial institutions. These are service providers that work the land on behalf of the financial institutions that sit in London, in, in, in New York, or wherever, wherever it is. Decision-making over land is now being, from abroad, outsourced, and depends on other instruments than the decision-making tools that family farmers have. These are financial, these are corporate, et cetera, et cetera. The extreme concentration is not only on land, it's also on the value chains. And if you want to address the concentration or the situation, the concentration on land and the situation for family farmers, not only land concentration will have to be addressed, but also the concentration in the value chains that are more and more globalized. So which opportunities, which solutions for that? Well, first of all, we have to address this land inequality story. 
And here we give four, four examples uh, to do so. We speak about redistributive agrarian reform, but that is, this is not always possible anymore in a more and more globalized world. Land taxes are put to the fore, that can be used very originally to distribute and redistribute the land. Very important is land market regulations and institutions at various levels, national or, or, or localized, like is being done in Germany and France, for example. And then lastly, corporate and investor accountability are very important tools to, to limit and to, to contract uh, land concentration. But we should not only minimize I think there's also a, a proactive way of, of, of acting. And that's why I emphasize here these two, two, two bullets. There's a need to support alternative models. These alternative models um, are twofold for us. First of all, support collective land rights and address horizontal inequalities, meaning um, a um, securing uh, aspects like gender or, or protecting aspects like gender, ethnicity, culture um, to, be, to be protected uh, in view of more localized, sustainable and resilient uh, food systems. Secondly, is to support other ways of producing, other farm models. And here we speak about inclusive food chains, we speak about agroecology, we speak about the, the slow food um, uh, movement, ways that are not counteracting land inequality, that are proposing or that are alternatives to these, uh, to these concentrated um, uh, ways of farming and, and concentrated food systems. I'll stop it here. Um, as I said, it was not an all the way opportunities and, 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 and uh, resilient farm systems, but a threat to be aware of and to be taken care of if you want to see a more sustainable planet, a more sustainable food system. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was an extremely interesting uh, uh, presentation on the concentration of resources and such a key resources as land. And I have to say, I remain shocked by the data on, on South Africa. It's, it's, I thought it was a mistake at the beginning. I will pass now the word to, to Valeria, um, Valeria Barchiesi from the UN Mountain Partnership and the co and the more and the newer, let's say, Coalition for Fragile Ecosystems, which I'm sure Valeria will tell us more about. Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Federico. I will share my screen. Can you see it now? Yeah, okay. So good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you are. My name is Valeria Barchesi, and I am the assistant coordinator of the Mountain Partnership Products Initiative, which is an initiative um, that certify and label uh, ethical and fair organic products at, and uh, aims to strengthen the resilience of mountain peoples, their economy and their ecosystems. It also helps consumers to choose carefully by narrating the story behind the product and uh, create an emotional connection with consumers. And recently it has been selected by the Expo Dubai 2021 uh, Global Best Practice Program. And it represents one of the existing concrete opportunities as we have seen uh, from the previous speakers uh, that can give recognition to family farmers and that can achieve the, the objective of uh, un the United Nations decade of uh, family farming. Um, but first of all, uh, why in mountains? Because um, as you can see from these figures, mountains matter. Over 50% of the entire human population depends on mountain for water, food, and clean energy. And mountain areas are heavily affected by climate change, far more than other regions. And of the 1 billion people living in mountain, 50% of rural mountain people uh, in developing countries face hunger and malnutrition. And they are around 300 million people. Moreover, from a global perspective, uh, mountain farming is family farming. 
agriculture is often the backbone of the economy in mountain areas and mountain agriculture is primarily green with low impact and high diversity. It is based on family farming, um, on traditional knowledge that have been developed throughout the centuries and in most of the mountain areas represent a precondition for uh, survival. And um, it is based also on the work of women because in, in mountains, uh, men often leave their families in search of better jobs in the cities. Uh, moreover, the, the remoteness of uh, mountain farmers often limits the use of pesticides and promote uh, farming in an organic manner. And if they are not organic, uh, mountain family farms, mountain farms have strong potential for switching or reverting to organic practices um, relatively easily in comparison to large scale lowland businesses. And uh, finally, there is an opportunity out there for the rising demand of quality food, fair food and uh, beverage, uh, beverages in particular for mountains, such as coffee, tea, honey, herbs, spices, traditional grains, handicrafts and cosmetics. However, uh, small scale mountain businesses are often disadvantaged if compares to lowland businesses and cannot compete in the same market with the lower prices and larger volumes. So mountain areas are characterized by uh, fragmented farming lands with different climates on the altitudes and with high limits for mechanization. And uh, the isolated mountain producers often have limited access to markets, extension services and um, credit. And the high number of intermediaries along the value chain uh, means that um, farmers do not always um, receive a fair compensation for their, their work. And despite the rich culture and her environmental heritage, uh, these communities remain marginalized and the current pandemic uh, has terribly worsened the, the situation. So these are the reason why uh, this initiative, the Mountain Partnership Products Initiative focuses on mountain products and it provides technical and financial support to smallholder producers from developing countries to create enterprises, improve their production techniques, uh, enhance marketing um, and differentiate their products from the competition. And the, the MPP label was launched in 2016 in collaboration with Slow Food International. And it is a narrative label, as I said, which tell the story behind uh, the product, uh, the origin, how it is farmed and processed, the, the nutritional values, uh, the role in the local culture of every product. And so it creates this, this connection with the consumers and helps them to make um, an informed uh, purchase. So um, moreover, the initiative support the farmers in establishing um, a quality assurance system for the products. Um, and we have created the first international network of participatory guarantee systems or PGS specific for mountains. And all partners commit to establish a PGS that certify their farming system, not only one product, but the entire farming system um, as ethical, fair and organic. And um, the PGS is what we can call a low cost certification scheme for organic products that is valid for domestic market and uh, that is adapted to every local uh, context. And um, so uh, finally, the, um, to date, the MPP scheme uh, has supported around 10,000 smallholder mountain farmers, 60% of them are women. And uh, the project operates in eight countries and include 20 products ranging from the pink and purple rice from India's Himalaya to the golden berry gem from the Peruvian Andes and the wild flower honey from Mongolia, among others. So um, in conclusion, um, 
has Mountain Partnership Secretariat, we recommend in the framework of the United Nations uh, decade of family farming to ensure that uh, mountain farmers are closely involved in national family farming secretariats and that mountain areas are incorporated in family farming strategies. Uh, to secure the involvement of adequate representation of mountain farmers in global farmers organization represented on the UN uh, decade of family farming and um, engage finally with ethical private private sector this last point has been fundamental in our in our initiative in in our work um, because this, the engagement with ethical private sector uh, can help in identifying the right market for specific products and recognize the value of products cultivated in fragile ecosystems. So not only mountains, but also islands. And this is what the coalition of fragile ecosystem aims for. I think my time has ended, but I will, I will finish the, the presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria, and um, very interesting um, uh, contribution. Also, I really like how uh, both of the organizations have always created this link between landscapes, communities, and the food systems, and how the communities uh, shape and are shaped by the landscapes in which they, in which they live, um, and also on the parts of PGS. So thank you, Valeria. Uh, I will now pass the, um, the floor to our next speaker, uh, Guillerme Brady who is the Head of Family Farming Engagement and Parliamentarian Alliances Unit at FAO. Um, Guillermo, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Federico. Gracias. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> obrigado. Uh, yo voy a hablar en español. Laura me pidió para hablar en español y así tenemos un poco de diferentes idiomas en las presentaciones. Uh, ¿Pueden ver la presentación? Sí. Ok, eh, entonces eh, muchísimas gracias primero de todo por la invitación eh, de Slow Food, eh, un placer estar eh, con vosotros en ese panel de discusión con experiencias muy interesantes, también agradezco muchísimo ahí esa iniciativa conjunta entre el Foro Rural Mundial y Slow Food aprovechando ese espacio fantástico de Terra Madre para discutir el diseño de las Naciones Unidas para la Agricultura Familiar. Eh, y bueno, quisiera presentarles algunos elementos así más centrales, eh, eh, considerando el tiempo eh, corto que tenemos. Pero el primer mensaje que quisiera a, dar a, a todos que, que nos están siguiendo es que eso es una iniciativa, Laura ya mencionó, eh, de movilización muy grande de organizaciones de la sociedad civil, o sea, es basada en el, eh, en el éxito, en la experiencia anterior de realización del Año Internacional de la Agricultura Familiar en 2014, pero que viene de un proceso iniciado en 2009 para eh, crear el Año Internacional, y eso sigue eh, fortaleciéndose y, y construyéndose un, una alianza ¿no? entre organizaciones eh, de la agricultura familiar y, y sus gobiernos para poder traer ese tema a la agenda internacional. Entonces, ahí en, en finales de 2017, las Naciones Unidas, la Asamblea General, eh, declara, proclama el diseño de las Naciones Unidas para ese periodo entre 2019 y 2028. Y ahí hay eh, tres mandatos bastante claros. ¿no? Uno es la necesidad de fortalecer políticas públicas en la agricultura familiar, fortalecer inversiones en la agricultura familiar y fortalecer los conocimientos, el intercambio de, de conocimiento, de saberes eh, sobre agricultura familiar. Entonces ahí y, y, y pide a la FAO y al IFAD para eh, participar en activamente en la implementación de ese diseño. Entonces eh, empezamos a trabajar conjuntamente con el IFAD, eh, partimos de la experiencia de construcción de, de implementación del año internacional, Constituimos un comité de pilotaje internacional compuesto por miembros de los gobiernos, de los países, de las diferentes regiones y más eh, representaciones de las organizaciones de productores de nivel global y de las diferentes regiones. Y a partir de ahí construimos un plan de acción uh, global 
que fue lanzado en 2019 juntamente con el lanzamiento del decenio. Yo creo que un punto muy importante es que todos los decenios de las Naciones Unidas en el momento son para sumar, para contribuir a los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible para la Agenda 2030. Entonces, es un reconocimiento a ese potencial de contribución de la agricultura familiar para el alcance de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, como ya mencionaron anteriormente, tanto de, de, a partir de solucionar los desafíos, los problemas ¿no? que, que tienen, pero también de ese potencial de transformación de la agricultura familiar como un agente de transformación de sistemas alimentarios. Entonces, ese plan de acción que me referí, global, da un marco y una orientación eh, a, a quien quiera implementar, eh, es estructurada en siete pilares, ¿ok?, yo acá no logro, no logro ver todos los pilares por, por la pantalla, pero bueno, un, un pilar que es enfocado en cómo mejorar el ambiente eh, de, de funcionamiento de la agricultura familiar. Entonces, tener un marco, mejores marcos institucionales, normativos, marcos de políticas públicas uh, específicas. Eh, un otro es cómo apoyar eh, la, la juventud rural y asegurar una, un, un, un cambio generacional sostenible en la agricultura familiar. Pilar 3, para promover la equidad de género en la agricultura familiar, el papel del liderazgo de las mujeres. El pilar 4, fortalecer las organizaciones de los agricultores familiares y su capacidad de generar conocimiento, representar a sus miembros y prestar servicios inclusivos. Como ya vimos ahí en otros, uh, otras presentaciones, y no voy a entrar en todos los datos, pero estamos hablando de muchos agricultores con una escala pequeña, más o menos 95% de todas las unidades tienen alrededor de 5 hectáreas. Si sumamos las que tienen hasta 20 hectáreas, son más o menos 80, 98% de todas las unidades agrícolas. Entonces hay, hay un, 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 un número muy grande que necesita trabajar conjuntamente y solidariamente, en cooperación. Entonces, el rol de las organizaciones es fundamental en cualquier estrategia de fortalecimiento de la agricultura familiar. El pilar 5 es mejorar la inclusión socioeconómica, la resiliencia y el bienestar de los agricultores familiares, los hogares y comunidades rurales. El pilar 6 para promover la sostenibilidad de la agricultura familiar para conseguir sistemas alimentarios resilientes al cambio climático. Y el pilar 7 para promover esa, esa, esa multidimensionalidad de la agricultura familiar, que también ya hablamos en otras presentaciones acá anteriores. No, no es apenas producir, son todos los vínculos que se establecen a partir de la agricultura familiar, con el territorio, con, con la biodiversidad, con el medio ambiente, con, la, con los eh, valores culturales existentes en esos territorios. Entonces, de modo bastante resumido y sin tiempo de profundizar, esos son siete pilares eh, les invito a, a visitar el Plan de Acción Global, yo voy a compartir acá después de la presentación. Tiene no apenas esos pilares, pero uh, resultados esperados, eh, acciones sugeridas y metas en cada uno de esos pilares que se buscan alcanzar hasta 2028. Entonces, ¿dónde estamos? Eh, lanzamos eso en 2029. Quisiera destacar tres partes centrales del trabajo que estamos realizando hasta ahora. Primero es estamos apoyando que ese eh, que, que el diseño llegue a los países, ¿no? Eh, la orientación muy clara de nuestro comité eh, internacional de pilotaje. El diseño no es apenas una iniciativa de advocacy, de campaña, de llamar la atención como fue el año internacional. Ahora es sí de estructurar políticas, es entrar en un aspecto más programático. Entonces, el gran, eh, la gran prioridad en el momento es cómo ayudar a los países a alcanzar esa grande meta que se estableció en el Plan de Acción Global de tener 100 planes nacionales, o sea, 100 países desarrollando planes nacionales para la agricultura familiar. Entonces, ese es el gran esfuerzo que está en curso. Y uh, con menos de dos años eh, completos de, de implementación, ya contamos, y ahí un trabajo muy fuerte realizado en conjunto con el Foro Rural Mundial, más de 50 países trabajando en esa dirección. ¿okay? De esos 50 países, más o menos, un poco más de 50, siete ya aprobaron planes nacionales. República Dominicana, Gambia, Indonesia, Costa Rica, Nepal, Panamá. Hay ocho países 
ya con procesos muy avanzados en etapa de validación, de finalización de sus planes nacionales y esperamos que eh, aprueben sus planes nacionales durante el año de 2021. Entonces ahí tenemos Bolivia, Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, Madagascar, Filipinas, Togo, Sierra Leone, en, en estadios muy avanzados. Y otros países que están empezando discusiones, eh, empezando diálogo, buscando movilizar actores para trabajar conjuntamente eh, en esos temas. Eh, Laura ya mencionó, eso viene con un proceso muy sólido de movilización social, muchos actores involucrados, y creo que eso es el, uno de los elementos centrales del buen... Eh, eh, éxito hasta el momento del proceso, porque tiene una base social muy sólida por detrás, principalmente de las organizaciones eh, de productores eh, llevando y, y trabajando con sus gobiernos para avanzar en esos temas. Eh, más de casi 1.600 actores eh, de diferentes características participando en esas actividades. Eh, y un segunda, una segunda parte que también estamos invirtiendo mucho en esos años iniciales, es de buscar estructurar algunos eh, productos técnicos que puedan apoyar la implementación a nivel nacional. Entonces, acá eh, estamos ya con un producto finalizado y otros dos en etapa final, eh, que son un, un documento de análisis de marcos reguladores, marcos regula, eh, reg, de regulamentación y legislativos sobre agricultura familiar, o sea, visitamos una serie de legislaciones eh, de todo el mundo y vendo de qué manera los países están reconociendo sus sectores, identificando los criterios eh, específicos de identificación o en qué áreas de política eh, eh, existen uh, uh, políticas, programas más específicos direccionados a la agricultura familiar. Tenemos un marco de, de aprendizaje eh, para capacitadores o sea, de sobre for, fortalecimiento organizativo. Aquí una serie de elementos que pueden ayudar a las organizaciones tanto a desarrollar capacidades dentro de sus líderes, ¿no? dentro de sus equipos, aspectos de fortalecimiento de sus capacidades de negociación o de comunicación o de, de evaluación de cómo funcionan los servicios que ofrecen sus miembros o de estructuración de sus procesos internos. Entonces, eso ya está eh, listo, fue desarrollado eh, en conjunto con una, un conjunto de organizaciones a partir de un proyecto con la Comisión Europea que finalizamos eh, el, el final del año pasado. Y estamos ahora eh, para finalizar... Eh, eh, el primer borrador de un programa de, de, de formación modular sobre ciclo de políticas públicas, o sea, para ayudar tanto a las organizaciones a tener una mejor comprensión de cómo se estructuran las políticas, las diferentes etapas y, y los elementos que tienen que ser considerados, como también poder fortalecer las capacidades de los estados nacionales de desarrollar en políticas públicas. Eso fue una prioridad muy fuerte que nos, que nos llegó cuando estuvimos eh, haciendo el proceso de consulta para estructurar el plan eh, de acción global. O sea, tanto las organizaciones pidiendo eh, mejor capacidad, comprensión de cómo funcionan las políticas, pero también los estados diciendo que perdieron su capacidad de formulación. Entonces, aquí vamos a combinar la teoría de cómo se estructuran políticas públicas con casos concretos de políticas públicas para la agricultura familiar existentes y utilizando ejemplos de, de tipos de decisiones o opciones que se, puede, que se utilizaron en casos concretos, en 14 políticas públicas. Eh, eh, también eh, desarrollamos una, una metodología que puede ayudar a las organizaciones a tener mejores datos sobre sus miembros, sobre qué está pasando con sus miembros, Aquí es una metodología para, uh, uh, que, que fue uh, hecha de modo a ayudar durante ese periodo de pandemia, buscar tener uh, datos concretos sobre, sobre la membresía de las organizaciones. Y queremos, el último, es un deseo, uh, también avanzar, ya que cubrimos el parte, la parte legal, normativa, estamos finalizando la parte de políticas y la parte de, de organizaciones, eh, también empezar discusiones de modo a tener algún tipo de material que ayude a las organizaciones que juegan en ese campo 
econômico a, a, a tener modelos de negócio eh, inclusivos e poder desenvolver melhor suas estratégias. Aqui, obviamente, sabemos que há muitas coisas eh, em curso já existentes e, e queremos partir para ver primeiro aqui o que existe e, e dialogar. E aqui, Federico, com o Slow Food, queremos muitíssimo avançar nessa discussão e sabemos que tem muito para aportar. E uma terceira parte importante do trabalho, do desenho até o momento, é uma, uma rede de, de comunicação eh, inclusiva. Então, em três regiões, em uh, Latinoamérica, com Onda Rural, em África, com Lien Casa, e em Ásia, com Conde Aveja, eh, estamos apoiando o diálogo entre organizações de produtores com os meios comunitários, rádios, eh, rurais e outros meios, de modo a poder levar melhor informação às comunidades eh, rurais e, e aos agricultores e agricultoras. Eh, e, e aí se desenvolvem de maneira participativa um conjunto de mensagens relacionados ao desenho, à agricultura familiar e também produtos específicos que podem ser compartilhados e utilizados eh, em os diferentes meios e essa, nessa rede de serviços eh, de comunicação rural. Uh, então, se, eh, há um potencial muito grande, temos mais de 200 eh, rádios trabalhando junto com as organizações nesse sentido. Obviamente, tem um alcance potencial de milhões de pessoas eh, que, que ainda não alcançamos esse potencial completo, mas vamos avançando nessa direção. E um conjunto de materiais, produtos, eh, que de maneira eh, adaptada ao contexto de cada região eh, se vai estruturando. Então, para finalizar, eu quisera destacar alguns elementos que já também já foram mencionados. Não? Eu creio que o desenho ajuda a, a buscar. Primeiro ponto, eu creio que a Laura mencionou, é uma oportunidade porque coloca a agricultura familiar em um nível bastante alto na agenda internacional. Obviamente, há todo o desafio de que isso agora se conecte com todos esses outros processos que, que, que estão em curso, não? e como é, seguir encontrando a maneira de operacionalizar isso. É, então, é por isso, o esforço de, de levar é, de um modo bastante concreto a implementação a nível nacional, a partir da construção de políticas específicas, de melhores marcos é, normativos, legislativos. É, e, e, e de uma maneira sistêmica, de um trabalho que não é apenas a partir do Ministério da Agricultura, mas de encontrar as portas de entrada de contribuição da agricultura familiar para as diferentes políticas, para a política ambiental, para a política social, de que maneira isso pode conectar com a política nutricional e como também é, é, é a, a, a alavanca não? de... de de dinamização econômica de los territórios e isso vem crescendo muito agora durante durante a crise e o interesse por essa área é, buscando a partir de los planos ter esses marcos bem identificados quais são as ações quais são as políticas onde há que desenvolver o que existe e o que há que desenvolver e buscando também identificar quem são as instituições responsáveis com quais pressupostos esses, essas políticas e esses programas se vão a, a, a organizar. É, creio que outro, outra oportunidade que também já foi é, reforçar o que Laura mencionou, eu não necessitaria falar das oportunidades, porque Laura cobriu todas elas, nem ele disse, mas é também uma plataforma de diálogo importante, então muitas vezes é, ajuda a reforçar é, os canais de, de diálogo e de interação entre o governo e agricultores familiares, e também as alianças entre as organizações de diferentes setores, a academia, os consumidores, instituições de investigação de, 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 e por aí vai. Então, se, eh, sem eh, perder muito mais tempo, eu finalizaria por aqui. Eh, estou à ordem e eh, já identifico aqui das conversas, das apresentações anteriores, pontos que me interessam muito depois seguir bilateralmente com com alguns de los colegas que apresentaram na cá. Muitíssimas graças pela oportunidade. 
Thank you, Guillerme. There was a lot to cover, and I promise that next time, not only will I leave you more time, but I will also invite you to, to present in Portuguese. So <laughs> I, I hope you are happy about, about this. But very interesting. Thank you, Guillerme. Before I pass the, the, the floor to our last speaker for today, I've seen a few comments uh, requesting the recording of the seminar and so forth. Of course, we will be providing the recording, and I will be asking the speakers if they are willing to share their presentations. But I would imagine so. So everyone be, uh, we will be doing that. Uh, so now our last speaker for today, um, Daniel Campos, who is the coordinator of the National Committee of Family Farming from Paraguay. Uh, please, uh, who will also be presenting in Spanish, if I'm not mistaken. So Daniel, por favor. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias al Foro Rural Mundial, al Slow Food y a la Coalición Internacional de la Tierra por esta invitación que nos ha hecho para participar en, esta, en este seminario internacional virtual que estamos desarrollando sobre el diseño de la agricultura familiar campesina y las oportunidades y potencialidades. Otro. La segunda, la, la próxima. Eh, en Paraguay se da fundamentalmente un modelo productivo en conflicto de tierra con, la, con el agronegocio degradante, deforestador, que es un poco de la, de la expansión de la soja transgénica sobre los territorios de la agricultura familiar campesina y sobre los territorios de la agricultura indígena. Otro, otro slide. La segunda slide. Esta es la expansión que es, está sufriendo permanentemente la agricultura familiar campesina del, del, agro, del agronegocio, eh, fundamentalmente, que no tiene... Eh, compasión de los territorios campesinos y de los territorios indígenas y de los bosques del agua eh, como para hacer toda una deforestación. Otro, otro slide. El territorio de la agricultura familiar campesina asegura fundamentalmente la soberanía alimentaria y la biodiversificación eh, con su producción y se, se diferencia fundamentalmente por el modelo de producción y al mismo tiempo por su modelo de relaciones, relaciones eh, solidarias de, en el marco de la agroecología y la economía solidaria, mucho más resiliente y mucho más consciente y respetuosa con la madre tierra. Otro slide. Otro slide, por favor. Estas son las producciones diferentes de la agricultura familiar campesina. Fundamentalmente es con una eh, eh, característica familiar, característica comunitaria, de producción comunitaria, de relaciones comunitarias. Otro slide. Acá tenemos fundamentalmente en un solo slide que nos muestra y nos caracteriza cómo son las relaciones de la agricultura familiar campesina e indígena del Paraguay. Y creo yo también, viendo todas las la agriculturas familiares de todo el mundo, cómo se están dando no solamente en el Paraguay, sino también en el mundo entero. Que fundamentalmente es familiar, comunitaria, eh, solidaria, fraternal, que trata de ser respetuosa con la madre tierra. La siguiente, el siguiente slide, el siguiente. Este, el, nosotros hemos comenzado todo una, una, un proceso con el Comité Nacional de la Agricultura Familiar Campesina e Indígena en el Paraguay, eh, que se constituyó en el 2014, en el Año Internacional de la Agricultura Familiar Campesina, 
y en el primer foro nacional que se estuvo organizando eh, con el protagonismo de todas las organizaciones nacionales y las plataformas nacionales de organizaciones campesinas del Paraguay, con participación de ONGs, eh, academia, e inclusive en un primer momento estaban participando las instituciones públicas y las organizaciones se pusieron prácticamente el primer eh, objetivo fundamental del, del, del año internacional, que es de tratar de superar la invisibilidad que tenía la agricultura familiar campesina eh, en la sociedad nacional y que eso se reflejaba fundamentalmente en las políticas públicas. No había eh, prácticamente leyes que podrían eh, reflejar la situación y defender los intereses de la agricultura familiar campesina. Entonces, lo primero que se planteó es una ley de la agricultura familiar campesina y la creación de un ministerio de la agricultura familiar campesina. El siguiente, siguiente slide. Dentro de estas políticas públicas, se estuvo fundamentalmente eh, luchando a través de movilizaciones, resistencia para crear este marco, el marco legal fundamental eh, de la ley, eh, la ley marco de la agricultura familiar campesina. Eh, siguiente. Y después generar instituciones, tanto en las organizaciones campesinas como en las propias organizaciones, y eh, pelear por un presupuesto nacional que se tenga en cuenta ya en el mismo presupuesto de la nación. El siguiente, con participación de las organizaciones campesinas. El siguiente. Esto fundamentalmente con una clara visión eh, de la agricultura familiar y de las organizaciones campesinas sobre la, las, las ayudas de proyectos y asistencialismo que tienen hasta este momento como política de Estado los gobiernos que, hemos te que estamos teniendo hasta este momento. El siguiente. Los principales hitos conquistados entre 2014 y 2020 del Comité Nacional de esta manera, a través de diferentes actividades, foros, plenarias nacionales, departamentales, municipales, audiencias nacionales eh, con apoyo eh, de financiamiento internacional del, del FIDA, del, del propio FAO, eh, de ONG de cooperación internacional, del Foro Rural Mundial, se consiguió en 2015 la ley 5446 de las políticas públicas para las mujeres rurales fundamentalmente resultado de la participación y de la lucha de las mujeres campesinas, con apoyo siempre de las organizaciones nacionales donde participan eh, protagónicamente las mujeres. En este momento prácticamente la mayoría de las organizaciones nacionales <coughs> tiene como coordinadora nacional a una mujer. Luego <coughs> tenemos la ley 6286 del 2019 de la defensa, restauración y promoción de la agricultura familiar campesina, que se consiguió fundamentalmente luego de 48 días de resistencia y lucha en las calles de Asunción y cerrando ruta en, todos los de, en todas las cabeceras, ciudades, cabeceras departamentales de, de la República. De esta manera, esto se llevó a cabo en el 2018, en donde se aprobó en, los dos, en las dos cámaras del Parlamento Nacional y en el 2019 se logró la promulgación por el Ejecutivo. El decreto reglamentario 3929 del 2020 de la agricultura familiar campesina, que es el se elaboró fundamentalmente eh, eh, sin participación de la agricultura familiar, el rechazo de cómo se, 
se elaboró este decreto reglamentario que según las organizaciones campesinas no refleja la ley de la agricultura familiar campesina en la que prácticamente se, se reflejó toda la participación de las organizaciones campesinas con el apoyo que se tuvo y sobre todo la comprensión que se tuvo de eh, bancadas del Parlamento Nacional con los, con los cuales se estuvo en alianza y en negociación por más de eh, tres meses de diálogo y negociación para poder sacar la ley. La, de, de esta manera tenemos en este momento eh, el decreto reglamentario que se quiere revisar como un hito posterior. Todo esto se hizo desde el 2014 con la consigna de la agricultura familiar campesina causa nacional. El siguiente. Tres hitos fundamentales que este, se, se está planteando en el Comité Nacional de la Agricultura Familiar Campesina e Indígena para el 2021 es la instalación del Viceministerio de la Agricultura Familiar Campesina que justamente se acaba en este momento de nombrarse al viceministro de la agricultura familiar campesina sin ninguna participación de las organizaciones. De por sí no se está de acuerdo con el nombre de la persona y la persona designada, pero por lo menos eh, se está en una situación de, de plantearle una, un diálogo franco y una, un un trabajo participativo en el marco de lo que es la, la ley de la agricultura familiar campesina para poder iniciar en, en primer momento la revisión del decreto reglamentario 39-29 de acuerdo al espíritu de la ley de la agricultura familiar campesina. Y el segundo punto fundamental con el viceministerio ya instalado, con este viceministro ya designado, tenemos que ponernos la elaboración participativa del Plan Estratégico Nacional del Decenio 2019-2018 y, y su promulgación como decreto presidencial o al menos como resolución ministerial. Eso es un planteamiento fundamental que se tiene y en este momento también con eso estamos planteando porque forma uno de los pilares del Plan Estratégico como parte del plan estratégico global que acaba de, de plantear tanto Guillermo como Laura, uno de los pilares es tener todos los datos sobre la agricultura familiar campesina y en ese planteamiento en, en el 2022 eh, se están haciendo, la, el, actualizando el censo nacional agropecuario y en ese planteamiento se quiere tener la participación de la agricultura familiar campesina del comité y de todas las organizaciones para que ninguna de las unidades productivas campesinas fuera puedan ser marginados y nuevamente eh, invisibilizados y esto es toda una tarea importante que se tiene que hacer porque tenemos datos que prácticamente eh, el 25, casi el 30% de las unidades productivas eh, más empobrecidas y más marginadas se quieren eh, continuar invisibilizando en el censo y de, 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 entonces prácticamente es un subconteo, el censo podría de, de estar siendo un subconteo de la realidad eh, objetiva de la, de la cantidad de las unidades familiares de la agricultura campesina en el Paraguay, como para poder en base a eso exigir políticas públicas, exigir planes, exigir programas y exigir proyectos, exigir inversiones que puedan dejar realmente sacar a la agricultura familiar campesina de su pobreza, de su marginación, de su exclusión en la sociedad nacional. El siguiente. Siguiente slide. 
Quiero terminar con una frase de del gran científico Albert Einstein. Si busca resultados distintos, no haga siempre lo mismo. Nosotros planteamos eh, el espíritu de la construcción del, del, del plan nacional, del plan estratégico nacional del decenio de la agricultura familiar campesina del Paraguay eh, con, una, con un objetivo fundamental, construir una política y una economía con rostro humano en el Paraguay con la agricultura familiar campesina, que es el único eh, modelo de producción y modelo de relaciones de la, de sociales que pueda estar planteando una alternativa de política y una alternativa de economía que pueda sacar a la, al, al Paraguay mismo de, la, de, su, de, su, de su modelo eh, agroexportador fundamentalmente destructivo e irrespetuoso con la madre tierra. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. A very important presentation on the need to really push public, uh, the public sector to create that enabling uh, environment from a legislative point of view, from a normative point of view, which uh, without this, it is impossible to then promote family farming and sustainable food systems. Very interesting, Daniel. Thank you. Um, as you may have all realized, uh, we are a bit late on schedule. I, I will take all the responsibility of this. I did not interrupt the speakers uh, because they were speak the, the content was so interesting, but I will take responsibility. Um, maybe what we can do, if anyone from the audience has a very pressing question, uh, we can take it. If not, as I said before, I'm very willing to share all the different uh, links to the recording, uh, possibly even the mails of the speakers, if, if they give me, if they agree, so you can ask them questions. And, and then lastly, we will uh, um, do a final, rec a final conclusion and recommendation. So if anyone from the floor has a very pressing question, uh, maybe we have time for, for one question. If not, great, because then I will be able to, I know you're shy and I'll take advantage of your shyness, because first of all, I wanted to, to thank everyone who was involved here. I wanted to thank all the speakers for, for their excellent presentations. I'm sorry that uh, you did not have twice as much time uh, to speak because definitely it would have been interesting. I would like to thank all the, the technical expertise of so the interpreters and the, the technical people which enabled us to do this webinar. And more than anyone else, I would like to, to thank Laura and their colleague La and Naroa who both were the drivers, the real drivers behind this webinar. Without them, it would have not happened. And in that respect, um, I would like uh, Laura maybe to, to say a few words as the closing remarks and, um, and to close this webinar off. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Please, Laura, if you could say a few final words. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. I will uh, shift into, into Spanish, which is my mother language. Bueno, yo quiero agradecer todas las interesantísimas exposiciones en el día de hoy. Eh, me ha parecido terriblemente pertinente ¿no? eh, relacionar el trabajo que, que hace Slow Food, el trabajo que hace FAO, el trabajo que hace, que hace el Mountain Alliance, el trabajo que hacen los Comités Nacionales de Agricultura Familiar, eh, etcétera, ¿no? el trabajo que hacen las organizaciones agrarias, las, las organizaciones de productores y es precisamente esto el decenio, ¿no? el decenio es una oportunidad, hemos dicho 100 veces en el día de hoy, eh, para unir a diferentes agentes que, que luchan por, por mejorar la situación de la agricultura familiar en torno a mesas de debate y sobre todo llevarlos a los espacios de decisión, ¿no? que eso es eh, algo muy relevante que tiene, que tiene el decenio. ¿no? Está mandatado el decenio para llegar a los espacios de decisión. Eh, es verdad que, que no todos son avances en, en las políticas públicas, como como se han referido en algunos eh, casos, eh, pero a la vez que, que hay avances en unos países, hay, hay retrocesos en otros. ¿no? Lo importante yo creo que es 
eh, por ejemplo, como nos lo contaba hoy Daniel, no, no siempre son éxitos eh, los que se ha conseguido en Paraguay, pero la lucha ha seguido ¿no? y se han conseguido conquistas muy importantes. ¿no? Entonces tenemos eh, la oportunidad de trabajar juntos. Eh, yo espero que esto haya servido también para establecer el link ¿no? entre, entre algunos agentes. Eh, a mí me ha quedado muchas... Eh, iniciativas ¿no? que me gustaría hablar con, con cada uno de los que han participado o sea que espero que esto sea eh, una, una forma también de vincular a, a los agentes eh, y agradecer el trabajo también con, con Slow Food y con ILC eh, para, que, para que este evento sea posible y podamos seguir construyendo ¿no? propuestas especialmente de política pública pero como decía Guillermo también el decenio tiene, tiene eh, la, la ambición ¿no? de, de llegar a, a tener programas que, que mejoren te, ¿no? la rentabilidad económica eh, de, las, de las explotaciones o eh, fomente programas que puedan eh, apoyar el trabajo de las organizaciones de productores, etc. ¿no? Entonces, bueno, pues eh, invitar a, a, a participar a todos, a todos los que están aquí y a muchos otros. Gracias. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I am sure and I totally agree with you that this is not the, the end of this, um, of this road, but rather one of the steps and that it, we will take the opportunity to work more closely together to implement more projects together and to, to create even more stable relationships. So once again, I would like to thank you all. I, I do th hope uh, you found this interesting. Um, I would like to thank the speakers. I would like to thank the audience. And I would like to thank everyone who was involved. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and, uh, and thank you very much. The future of our planet is decided at the table in our daily food choices. What do we know about what we eat? How do we choose? Where do we buy it? You can make a difference and contribute to a future where everyone has access to food that is good. Eating must be a pleasure for everyone. We all have a right to food that is healthy, natural, fresh, and seasonal. Clean. Being aware helps us to choose food that is good for our health and the health of our planet. Fair. Knowing our food means making choices that are fair to us, to the producers, and to future generations. Slow Food has been working for over 30 years to defend biodiversity and fight the climate crisis by promoting good, clean, and fair food for all. Slash en. And follow us at Terra Madre Salud.